Is Batista an all-time great in pro wrestling? Sup y'all, welcome back to the review space. In this video, we're going to take a look at the topic, the question of, is Batista an all-time great? And now that Batista has basically returned for probably his final uh, uh, feud or his final match against somebody, it's going to be against, probably, uh, against Triple H at WrestleMania, right? They're trying to set up that feud. After he went after Ric Flair, the legendary 16-time champion, right? Uh, he had, he was basically, you know, Batista went after him on the the previous episode of Raw, and we all saw it. We thought that, you know, a lot, most people I think thought it was a pretty cool segment. It was definitely kind of refreshing to see, you know, Big Dave back on on Raw at least for the time being. And I think this is probably going to be his final. You know, angle or his final match. It's going to be the the the, the send off of uh, Big Dave Batista. You know, he wants to have that one final match against Triple H, against Hunter. You know, somebody that he's got obviously a lot of respect for, and somebody that basically put him over like crazy way back in 2005, as as you know, uh, as that Evolution feud got really hot, and they ultimately ended up splitting up. That, that is, you know, the Evolution stable and all that. This is basically going to be the end of Batista's uh, in-ring career. Basically, his pro wrestling career, I would say, is that's it. It's over. Like this is, you know, probably going to be his last run. Now, I'm very, very, very curious about this particular topic, or I've been waiting to actually talk about this topic because, you know, Dave. It's it's interesting because Batista, at one point, was the highest pushed guy in wrestling back in the mid 2000s. You know, he was the champion on Raw. He became the the WrestleMania main event against Hunter in in WrestleMania 2005, I think Mania 21 for the World Heavyweight title. And that was at a time when that big gold belt, the the World Heavyweight Championship was the number 1 title in the WWE. So, I mean, he was even ranked number 1 of the uh, 500, you know, top uh, what was PWI 500 in 2005? Number one of the 500 best singles wrestlers back in uh, in 05. So he was he, he was pushed like crazy, and even after winning it at Mania, he took on you, you know Triple H at least a couple of more times after that. They had a couple of more matches following WrestleMania in in, in additional pay per views. And so he was. He kept winning, and he kept defeating Triple H, and kept defeating Triple H until finally that feud was ultimately over. And then Big Dave was. He was. He, they moved him to SmackDown because they had that you know switch up, or, or what, what do you call it? The the shake up, the roster shake up, in in the mid two thousand five uh, period where. Eventually, Cena was finally moved in, into Raw. He was a SmackDown champ, WWE champ, and they moved into Raw, and Batista was uh, moved to SmackDown. And it, the interesting thing is that I don't think Dave Batista was ever... He was never the most charismatic guy. He was never the most dynamic, you know, uh, uh, promo cutter. He never cut, like, amazing promos, and he actually suffered for that. You know what I'm saying? Like, the fans started to kind of negatively react to him. This was at a time when WWE, they lost The Rock the previous year in 2004. Um, they also lost Stone Cold Steve Austin in 2004. That was, I think that was his final match was against uh, The Rock in 04, uh, Mania 04. And so they didn't have Austin anymore because Austin retired. He, he was too injured and he was too, uh, basically, his body was too banged up. And, and The Rock was basically moving on to Hollywood and and so now they didn't have those two top faces of the Attitude Era and they were gone uh, another guy that left was Brock Lesnar Brock Lesnar was leaving in you know he, he left in 04 he wanted to become I think an NFL player or something he wanted to follow football and he didn't want that heavy schedule so you got not just the future or the would-be next top star in Brock but you had the previous generation uh, Rock and, and Cena, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Rock and Austin leaving, and so the only you know younger guys that they have, or the the newer stars and newer newer faces that they had at the moment, were guys like Randy Orton, Big Dave, and and John Cena. And at the time, you know, d during that 04-05 period, Randy really wasn't making it as a top star. 
You know what I'm saying? I think he was a little too bland. He just he just didn't have that dynamic personality or that incredibly huge drawing ability at that time. He was still kind of like trying to find his way, trying to find his his niche, and he just he just wasn't connecting with you know the mainstream audiences quite yet. Even though they already made him a, a world champion in 2004. And, and with Big Dave, they were a lot more careful with him. You know, he was a bigger guy. He's this physically imposing looking guy, very muscular. And he had all these tattoos and he, he looked different. You know, he had the short hair and he went up against Hunter. You know what I'm saying? He was going to be the guy to kind of defeat Hunter at Mania and, and take basically become the big baby face. The, 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 you know, supposedly the new top star taking over from guys like Austin and The Rock, you know, and kind of filling in that void. And he was... I, 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 I think the angle worked. You know, that angle worked back in 2005. You know, it worked perfectly because it was a dynamic between... It was a chemistry between Hunter, the big evil heel boss, you know, this kind of like mafia boss, and he was the top guy. He's the guy who's always the champion. You know, the, 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 the reign of terror, you know, the ruthless aggression... Uh, ruthless aggression, reign of terror, and Hunter was like the, the the big baddie. He was the big evil boss. And then you have Big Dave uh, Batista, who is the henchman. He's the muscle of the group. He's the big bruiser type. That's like the the powerhouse of the group. But now he's turning against Hunter. Now he wants to go up against the evil boss and make himself the champion and take the title for himself. So it was a cool storyline, with the you know. With, with the evolution finally dissolving and imploding onto itself. And it worked perfectly because now you're seeing the, the, the protege in Batista going up against the master, the mentor, uh, Triple H. And so it, it was a cool storyline, it worked perfectly, and the fans were invested into it. And people saw, I think, Dave Batista as somebody that could become a convincing heavyweight champion back in 2005. And it worked to a degree in that the angle worked, you know, but after like Hunter, after him, you know, going up against Hunter multiple times and, you know, overcoming the Hunter dragon and slaying the Hunter dragon, it, it was like Dave had nothing to do after that, you know, like after Triple H, it's like, what else does he have to do? Now he's the world champion and now they're putting him on the spot on Raw to cut these like 10 minute, 20 minute promos and he wasn't able to do it. And poor Dave, you know, poor Batista too. He had to follow. He had to follow guys like The Rock and Stone Cold, as as the microphone guy. And these guys were dynamic, like incredibly charismatic performers. Rock, Austin, you know, they were incredible on the microphone. And they cut these really funny or really interesting or just completely cool, uh, uh, charismatic promos that held the fans' attention. That you really wanted to hear them week after week after week. Whether it was The Rock. You know, saying his catchphrases every week, or Stone Cold, um, um, I'm calling out Vince McMahon. You know, so it, it was absolutely tremendous, and and Dave Batista had to follow these guys, but and it, it, he couldn't do it. He couldn't live up to that expectation. He couldn't. He just didn't have the charisma. He was a lot more, um, not necessarily bad on the mic, but he just was kind of. Uh, he he wasn't as comfortable. He wasn't as. He didn't come across as like entertaining. That was the problem. He wasn't that funny on the microphone, and he wasn't that interesting. He was just kind of a bland guy, and he just cut these, like, you know, kind of like, hey, guys, you know, I'm here to you know, be your champion. You know, I'm, I'm Batista, and I'm going to take over Raw now, you know. And it's like there, there was no there was no impact there. There was no interesting promos. He didn't cut any, really nothing memorable. And that's the big problem is that, now he's he's the raw guy and he's on the talking show, the A show, where Vince McMahon expects you to cut these 10, 15 minute promos and hold the fans' attention and just be a captivating storyteller. Well, that's why he brought up John Cena instead. You know, they kind of switch places. It's like, alright, forget this guy. Look, we're going to kind of hold Dave back a little. We're going to put Dave on SmackDown and just have him be the top guy there, but then let me have John Cena instead. And Cena, who was WWE champion at SmackDown, ends up going to Raw, and he's the one with the mic skills, you know, because he was the, the, the battle rapper, he was the guy that cut the funny promos, and he was the guy that was confident and very comfortable on the mic. He had that personality. 
And so that's what happened. That's basically what happened to Dave Batista. He just wasn't that great on the microphone. You know, yeah, he had a good look and all that, big muscular physique, but he just didn't have that mesmerizing, incredible drawing personality or that charismatic, you know, promo cutting ability. You know, he was a far cry from guys like a Ric Flair or an Austin or a Rock or even a Hogan. You know, even guys like Randy Savage that had that interesting character. So, unfortunately with Dave, he was, in, in some ways, he was demoted to SmackDown. Like, yeah, all right, like, he's he's good, and he's a top guy now, but, like, we're going to we're, we're gonna put him on SmackDown, you know, have him do something else. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Dave, do I consider him a one of the greatest of all time? Do I consider him one of the greatest wrestlers in history? Not really, you know. I think he was he 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 worked for the time, for his time period in that mid two thousands when WWE they they lost Brock Lesnar, they lost Austin, they lost Rock, and they needed a uh, a different looking wrestler who was very muscular, but had a a bit more of a a traditional wrestling look, and he was more he had the heavy tattoos, so he looked a little bit almost like an MMA fighter, you know. And so he just had that look. He just had that mid two thousands, you know, a uh, heavyweight look. Um, and so it worked. And also keep in mind that he wasn't the number one pick to be in Evolution back in the early mid two thousands. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was somebody else. I think it was Mark Jindrak, who was going to be their top like young, muscular uh, type guy. The you know the big muscle of the group of Evolution. It's kind of a good looking guy. He looked like a you know a big bodybuilder type, and he was supposed to be the, in the role of uh, Batista. You know what I'm saying? But things didn't quite work out the way it did. You know, for for Jindrak, he ended up leaving and going to I think Mexico instead, and finding some success on in Mexico instead. So, um, you know, Jindrak found his own different path in in wrestling, and instead it went to Big Dave Batista. He's the one who became you know what I'm saying he became the top. Uh, Raw guy, and he became the evolution guy. Um, so it, it's it's hard for me to say that he, like this guy's one of the best of all time. I mean, no doubt he's definitely in ho a Hall of Famer. You know, kind kind of similar to the uh, Roman Reigns thing. You know, is Ro Roman Reigns an all time great uh, uh, video that I did? I think Batista. Th there's some comparisons between him and Batista. You know, not the most like hyper charismatic dude. Although I would say that maybe Roman has a Roman, I think, in the ring is a little bit more polished and a little bit more dynamic w with his moveset. You know, he does the spear, he does the, the you know, the the, uh, the Superman punch and then the kick to the apron, and he does the dive, and he does a lot more, a little bit more high-flying or a little bit more physically impressive-looking moves than, than Batista. Batista's got, got, got some good moves, like the power bomb and all that. But it's. I always felt like Batista. He was just a little bit slower in the ring. I think it's also too because he was, he was a lot older too. He he wasn't like a young guy in his early twenties. You know what I'm saying? I was really shocked when I first found out that Batista, but when he when he became the, uh, world champion in 2005. So this was like you know after Mania, but not like too long after Mania. Maybe around like I don't know like May or June or July, something like that of 2005. And I found out his age. I was like. Man, Batista is like 37 or 38 years old. He was already in his late 30s. You know what I'm saying? He was already in his late 30s. So I was like, damn, like Batista's pretty old. You know, for, for a wrestler, he's, he was already up there in age. He wasn't like a young, you know, up and coming, like 21, 22 year old guy. He was like, I, mean, I could have sworn that maybe he was in his mid late 20s or maybe, maybe he's like 29, 28 years old. Kind of like John Cena at that time in, in, in 2005, but he was actually th like 38, 37. You know, the dude was born, I think, like in the, I don't know, like sometime in the in the 1960s. I'm trying to figure out, trying to look up his uh, actual uh, d date of birth. When when was Batista born? 1960, okay, 1969. So, yeah, 79, he would have been 10. 89, he would have been 20. 99, he would have been 30. So, yeah, definitely by 2005, yeah, he would have been like 30, uh, like maybe 36, something like that. Yeah, 36 years old, maybe. Around that around that age, that mid-late 30s period. Uh, mid-late 30s age. And he's now he's like 50 years old. He was born on January 18, 1969. He's 50 years old 
uh, this year. Man, he is 50. The big 5-0. Incredible. He's been around for a long time, man. Dave is 50 years old and he's still on Raw. <laughs> he's having a feud with Hunter. And Hunter is even older than him, I think. Hunter's probably... Wait, how, how old? Wait, hold on, wait a minute. I, actually, he might... I, I don't know if he's older or Triple H is younger than him. I, I, actually, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to find Triple, uh, Triple H's age. Let me see. Hold on. How old is Triple? Because I'm thinking Triple is older than him. He's got to be, right? No, 69. What? They were born the same year. He's 49. Wow, July uh, 69. Damn. So Triple H is actually uh, a few months younger than Batista. There you go. That's what I'm saying. Like, Batista's an old guy. <laughs> he was a late bloomer. He's very much a de the definition of a late bloomer. You know? And I think that... Uh, it was his size, it was his, his connection with Triple H, and it was him looking just a little bit different, and that, that's kind of what got him over. Um, and he had a bit of a work ethic that made him into a a top guy, but like I just I don't think he's an all-time great. I, I can't see him as one of the greatest of all time. I think he was a reliable um, um, you know, heavyweight back in the mid-2000s, that ruthless aggression era. And he was able to kind of do what Randy Orton couldn't do, you know, be the Evolution breakout star, at least for that time, and becoming a, a WrestleMania main eventer. He was able to kind of take over just a little bit from, like, you know, carrying, being the, the, the muscular monster-looking type guy that, that it was basically a void that Brock Lesnar left when he, you know, when he quit wrestling, basically, quit the WWE back in uh, 2004. And so he had these different things, and he was, you know, uh, again, being able to take over from Jindrak, from Mark Jindrak as the evolution guy. So all these different opportunities led up to Big Dave becoming the the chosen one, at least in 2005. And he became a former, you know, WWE champion. I think when he when he turned heel, I think maybe around 2010, he was, he was a much better character. He had the shades and everything, and the jacket, you know, the... the uh, the more rock star looking type guy, the Hollywood type, you know, type of uh, character. So I was, I, I, and I wasn't watching like a lot of wrestling at that time. I wasn't watching a, a lot of WWE anymore during that like 2010 period because, you know, the whole CM Punk thing, I, I think I mentioned this already, but, you know, when CM Punk defeated uh, Jeff Hardy, that got me really mad and really angry at uh, the product. I was like, man, this sucks. You know what I'm saying? I felt like they were replacing Jeff Hardy with CM Punk. And so that got me heated, so I stopped watching SmackDown and even Raw for a while, and I didn't realize that, you know, when Big Dave turned heel, he was doing some good work. You know, this was back when Bret Hart came back, and, you know, I think I was, I was watching a lot more TNA at that time. Um, but it was good work, especially looking back at his promos, his heel promos as a, you know, the, the evil heel that went up against, the, I think it was John Cena in 2010 at uh, WrestleMania. And this was before he left. He he wanted to go to Hollywood. He wanted to do the uh, you know the acting thing, and ultimately he became successful. At it. He became you know a, a very su surprisingly kind of a shocking you know surprisingly successful Hollywood actor. I mean that's kind of a cool thing. I, I don't think anybody really expected him to blow up in Hollywood and get all these different work and you know what I'm saying end up working in, in in big movies. You know these big blockbuster hits and and you know superhero comic book movies and 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 James Bond and all that stuff so tremendous stuff with with Batista as an actor I don't even really want him back per se like I don't even when he came back in 20 I think it was 2014 as as the Royal Rumble winner and taken over from you know everybody wanted to see Daniel Bryan instead and he was the one that got pushed instead and Evolution came back and all that stuff and Blue Tista that was just bad timing that nobody wanted that nobody really wanted to see big dave back i think now it's a little bit different in that it's kind of refreshing he's become an even bigger star in hollywood so he's a little bit more recognizable even by the modern fans and people are a little bit probably just slightly more nostalgic for for just a dave versus hunter kind of kind of angle like all right he's a big star let's bring him in i just don't I, i'm not necessarily like a huge fan of him coming back and just it, it's almost like this is more for him. This is a, you know, a Batista send-off, basically. That's all it really is. You know, and the, the whole thing with AEW trying to kind of, you know, 
having that talk or having that little photo with with Chris Jericho. That was just an excuse for him, and kind of like a, just a, just a warning shot to WWE and being like, listen, AEW is available. I'll go there if you don't want me in WWE. So you know, Hunter and Vince McMahon, they they had to bring him back because it's like you know AEW. They didn't want him going to AEW. Not that you know, not that Batista, I'm sure, would have gone there anyway. Like as like convincing, like I I gotta go to AEW. But like, I I think AEW right now is being used as leverage. People are using it as an excuse to 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 really have a, a solid position in WWE and have a little bit more creative. A creative uh, reason to, to kind of do their their own thing in WWE and at least have a little bit more like you know leverage and a little bit more leeway in the company, whether whether it's get, getting a spot you know at Mania or having demanding a little bit more money or just getting a title shot, you know what I'm saying I think they're using AEW. I don't necessarily think that these guys really want to go to AEW. They're not. They don't really want to go there. They just want to use AEW as a threat against WWE like it's it's like a warning like hey if you don't if you, you know, if Vince McMahon doesn't use me in WWE then I'd rather just go to AEW so then the WWE gets scared and they're like okay let's bring in Dave you know let's make the 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 revival guys the champion and all that and let's push you know, Sasha and Bailey you know because they're all threatening to do something with AEW we don't want them to do that so I, I, it's not necessarily a, a, a fans demanding that Dave come back. I just don't think we we're looking for new stars. I think that's what most wrestling fans want. Most WWE fans and all that they're looking for new up and coming talent that's like refreshing and different instead of going back to the old well of like you know you, Batista coming back or Goldberg coming back or even like part timers guys like. You know, even like Cena's become a part timer, and of course Brock Lesnar. You know, these guys that are not constantly there, people don't really—they're not obsessed with that. You know, people don't want part timers or just like Hollywood guys. We're looking for like actual wrestlers that's like gonna be big stars, guys that can actually be young, you know, modern stars of this generation. You know, whether it's somebody like a Lars Sullivan. Or uh, uh, Elias, or Rusev, or you know whoever. I mean, even somebody like a, you, you know, Alistair Black, or or somebody like that. You're just a younger guy who can carry the company for the next ten or fifteen years. I mean, it's it's hard to find those kind of guys. It's hard to find a young star that that could could be a main event level guy right now, especially in developmental. I think in NXT they have such a weak you know roster. You know, you see shades of brilliance with the younger guys, guys like, a, what's his name, Matt Riddle, you know, maybe even a Keith Lee, you, you know, but it's 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 hard for me to kind of buy into these guys right away because you you just don't know where they'll end, end up on the main roster, you know what I'm saying? If they end up getting a push, I mean, look at Bobby Roode and Shinsuke and, you know, guys that just kind of got derailed in, in some way, and they just never realized their full potential on the main roster. Even though I would say that Shinsuke, at least he won the Royal Rumble and all that, and you know, he became a mid-card level kind of uh, champion. Um, but you take a look at the other guys, the NXT guys, like, uh, you know what I'm saying, um, guys like Neville, you know, he's a former NXT champion. Guys like Bo Dallas, former NXT champion. Guys like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, Sami Zayn, a former NXT champion. And it's like, they just kind of end up not doing anything on the main roster, just kind of flopping. Um, so what else? Uh, yeah, yeah. So Batista, going back to Batista, um, he's he's one of these part timers that's been that's being brought back, and I do think he is a Hall of Fame worthy guy, no doubt. I mean, just like Roman Reigns, you know, at one point this guy was the number one guy in the company, uh, just positioned as the number one guy. I mean, he you know, Dave was never. He was never like this overwhel overwhelmingly popular guy. He was never like this super huge star like a Rock or an Austin or a Hogan, you know. Because this was at a time when now you got the ruthless aggression era, but it's more like a little bit late into it, like 2004, 2005, where they're not, they, they don't really, they can't really find those guys anymore. The closest would be John Cena because he has some charisma and mic skills. But like Batista just didn't have that incredible presence, um, not presence, but incredible charismatic like promo cutting ability. He just didn't have that captivating, uh, uh, funny on the microphone, incredible on the mic, and just 
having that personality, larger-than-life personality, that drew people in. He was more like, oh, he was, he's a big guy, he's a muscular-looking dude, and he's a champion, you know. But it's like, eh, like, he's all right, you know, he's all right. He wasn't anything, like, special. Um, so in some ways, he's kind of similar to, like, a Roman Reigns, where it's like, he's a big dude, but, like, and he, he could be a main event level guy, but it's like, you, you know, he's not the most charismatic, like, super amazing, super impressive, like, highly entertaining guy. You know, so people people are still looking for that incredibly charismatic uh, uh, Hogan level type of guy. You know, guys like a Randy Savage, guys like a Ric Flair. You know, even Shawn Michaels to a degree, even though he he didn't have the size. You know, I felt like Shawn Michaels was a little bit smaller, but he had an incredible amount of charisma. You know, same with guys. Of course, you know, Austin and Rock. You know, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more um, interesting characters. You know, definitely cool anti-hero type of characters. Um, and and Big Dave was never a part of that group. He he was never on that level, um, but he did have a cool you know a funny little heel run or a cool little heel run in 2010. That was pretty cool. Um, and then when he came back as as you, you know even even now you know he's still kind of a cool like you know villain. And I like the fact that he's a heel. Uh, at least that's something. You know he's not this bland generic babyface. So would I say that J uh, Dave Batista is an all time great? Not necessarily. I think at one point he was the number one position position guy in the company. They tried with him, but he just never fully got over as as an incredibly overwhelmingly super popular. I never even saw anybody that that really wore like Batista T-shirts. You know what I'm saying? Like selling merchandise and all that. I never really saw him sell a lot of like Batista shirts or anything. You know, they never they never really had like you know the the, the whole arena or the whole crowd would rocking like a Batista T-shirt. You know, so. He was just, uh, he was good for the time, you know, and it's kind of like a nostalgic thing now with him coming back to face against Hunter again, but it's like, eh, he was all right, you know, he was all right, and he's definitely going to be a Hall of Fame guy, but that's pretty much it, he's, he's good, you know, Batista, he's going to have a, you know, he's, he's had a good, good career, good run in Hollywood, but he just happened to be the, the, the right guy at the right place at the right time, but he was never the most captivating like superstar in wrestling um even in his prime you know what i mean guys like hogan austin rock in their prime were a lot bigger than than batista even somebody like goldberg i would say goldberg was way more popular than batista you know the master of the spear you know the jackhammer goldberg was a way more interesting character a lot more cool than than batista you know batista again he was okay he was okay <laughs> so that's it for this episode of the review space Thank you guys for watching, and go check out my, you know, is Roman Reigns an all-time great? It is uh, kind of an interesting topic, you know, is is Roman Reigns really an all-time great, you know? Kind of like the, the Batista topic. Um, subscribe to the channel for more uh, videos. I do talk a lot about pro wrestling, you know, different wrestling podcast topics on the channel. Um, click on the bell button for the latest notifications, and until next time, peace!